Hello everyone, welcome to video number three where we're going to be looking at the Age of Enlightenment. So we're now reaching the period of time where geology as a discipline and also paleontology, there wasn't initially much of a distinction between these two um, different fields of science, were born. So we're into a period that we call the Age of Enlightenment. And so an obvious question to ask is what is the Age of Enlightenment? So this is um, kind of the shorthand for a philosophical movement which dominated the world of ideas in Europe in the 18th century, so that's in the 1700s. It was a philosophical move movement which um, was based around the use of reason as a source of authority. So an example of that is the use of evidence within science. And it was um, kind of part and parcel of that included in this movement were other ideals, such as the ideas of liberty and tolerance. These are nicely summed up by these quotes on this slide by Voltaire, um, who was a famous Enlightenment thinker, and said things such as, those who can make us believe in absurdities can make us commit atrocities, I should say. Um, so it is this movement where a lot of the way that we do science kind of developed over this period. An obvious um, example of that is the Royal Society, the learned society um, that still runs today, um, that's based in London, which was the first real vehicle by which um, journals were used to disseminate science. So the fact that we use journal papers to disseminate science today really has its origins in the Age of Enlightenment. Um, often in the Age of Enlightenment, uh, other interesting things that you may wish to know, I certainly find them interesting, are that meetings occurred in coffee houses. So you can see an example of a London scene in the middle here um, with some of these rowdy coffee houses. So this was kind of an, at times an anti-authoritarian movement where people met up to discuss big ideas in informal rather than formal settings. And it may be interesting to you to note that the USA is essentially an Enlightenment society. The US Constitution, um, which is shown being signed here on the right, was based on these ideals and this philosophy. And so the USA as a nation, many of its founding fathers were Enlightenment thinkers and kind of included that in the US Constitution. So I think that's really interesting. So that's the framework of what was going on in 18th century Europe when geology was being born. And so if we're thinking about that, how that happened, one of the earliest big players was a gentleman called Robert Hooke that's shown in a modern portrait in the left-hand side of this slide. This man was English, he was a natural philosopher, and he was a polymath, meaning he did lots of different things. He made major advances in physics and astronomy, in chemistry, biology, and also, and why we're interested, in geology. But he also dabbled in, for example, architecture and naval technology. He is relatively obscure today um, because he was quite irascible in life. He didn't get on easily with other people. And Isaac Newton, who is famous for his work in um, physics in particular, um, and he had a large falling out. And Isaac Newton actively did quite a lot to try and obfuscate his legacy, to try and make sure people didn't really remember him. But a famous example that you may have heard of um, is Hooke's Law, if you ever covered that in physics, which is named after this gentleman. In kind of the biological and the life sciences, he was one of the first people to um, document cells, because he was one of the earliest users of a microscope, his illustration of cells. I believe in cork, um, the wood is shown on the right here. And he noted that fossilised wood had this same structure. He also um, made comparisons between fossil shells and those of living mollusks. You can see some illustrations in the middle of here of um, extinct members of the, the um, mollusk group, the cephalopods, which are, are included in some of his publications. He concluded that the fossil shells he were looking at were once alive, and also the dead wood could be turned into stone by the action of water rich in dissolved minerals, which would deposit minerals throughout that wood. As part of this work, he recognised different modes of preservation. For example, he could tell the difference between, difference between a cast and a mould. And he concluded that some fossils represented organisms that no longer existed on Earth. 
In fact, a direct quote I've written down here for you is, there have been many other species of creatures in former ages of which we can find none at present. And that is not likely, also but then there may be diverse new kinds now which have not been from the beginning. So these were actually quite advanced thoughts for the turn of the um, 18th century. So Robert Hooke was an important gentleman who made a lot of important observations. The next person I wanted to introduce you to is um, Will sorry, James Hutton. This is a Scottish gentleman farmer. He was a geologist, he was a physician, he was a chemical manufacturer, naturalist, and an experimental agriculturalist. He studied medicine in Edinburgh in Scotland, and at this time Edinburgh was kind of a, a centre in the UK of enlightenment thought. Then he moved to Paris. He then returned and set up chemical works in Edinburgh and played an active part in the Scottish Enlightenment. In the early 1750s, he moved to a lowland farm he had inherited um, for reasons that are not entirely clear to us. Um, there may have been some kind of scandal um, surrounding this. We know he'd already fathered an illegitimate child in 1747. Um, and some of his letters suggest that there was a love affair that went wrong in the 1750s that meant he just left Edinburgh and went to live in the lowlands. So this is the, the area um, south of the Highlands in Scotland. And he just took to being a farmer and observing soil and rocks. One of the things he did during this period was um, to establish the theory of uniformitarianism. This is the idea that the Earth is very, very old, and what happened in the past still happens today. And he suggested that features of the Earth's crust um, that we can see today have um, developed by means of natural processes over geological, so vast periods of time. The Earth could be understood, he made the case, through sedimentation and erosion in deep time, and it was perpetual. Um, and that's very much um, reflected in this famous unconformity that's shown on the right-hand side here that encompasses this idea of vast periods of time. What's happened to create this rock deposit is that these rocks here have been laid down flat, they've been lithified, they've been made into rock, they've been uplifted, tilted and eroded, and then these new rocks have been deposited on top. And it was through observation of formations like this that he built up these ideas. Here is the handsome gentleman shown on the left-hand side here. He even preempted some of the ideas of evolution via natural selection. And this is really interesting because his prose, his writing, was so poor that nobody listened or noticed. So actually his ideas were really revolutionary, but um, they didn't really stick because he didn't communicate them well. Other important people in the development of geology of the, at this time were Charles Lyell, who kind of picked up these ideas and ran with them and was um, a great inspiration to um, Charles Darwin, and William Buckland, who I think we'll be getting onto later in this series of videos, but described lots of fossils and had some interesting ideas about the world. Next person I wanted to highlight is a gentleman called William Smith. So this is another English geologist. He's shown on the top left-hand side here. He was interesting because he was the son of a blacksmith, so he was of humble origin. His day job was as a surveyor, first in mines and then for canals. The image on the right-hand side is actually a Manchester ship canal being um, built. So this is quite a bit later than William Smith, but I just, I really liked the painting, so I decided to put it in. Sorry about that. Um, but it shows you this process of digging canals, and by digging canals, you're forced to look at rocks of, and soils. And what William Smith did with his observations was that he noticed that the layers of rock that he saw when traveling throughout the UK digging canals were arranged in a predictable pattern. So he noticed, for example, that rocks from the Triassic period in the UK are generally dipping more steeply than younger rocks in the same in the UK, and that these have the same relative positions. One of the keys to his success later in life as a scientist is that he noted that each layer could be identified by the fossils it contained. And some, an example of some of his illustrations are shown on the left-hand side here. He came up with this idea, which we now call the principle of faunal succession, 
Basically, it just reflects that life evolves through time and that fossils you find in rocks of different ages vary through time. And fossils became his principal line of evidence for a very famous map of the geology of the UK that he created that's shown uh, on the slide here. This was the first geological map, mapping where rocks of different ages are found on the ground in the UK, and it was a real intellectual achievement that was even more impressive given his origins, um, which were outside the established system of education in the UK. And indeed, due to those humble origins, learned, educated society in the UK didn't really find out about his work, which was plagiarised by others. He was eventually financially ruined, spent time in a debtor's prison, um, and really had a tough period toward the end of his life. But later, later in his life, before he died, his contributions were actually recognised. So there's, there's an element of a happy ending to his story there, but it, I think it's um, very telling about society in this period, what happened to William Smith. So a, a real um, innovator. The next person I wanted to introduce to you to is Georges Cuvier. With apologies for my um, French, French pronunciation, his uh, full name is actually Jean-Léopold Nicolas Frédéric Cuvier. He was um, a French naturalist and zoologist, and from 1795 he was an assistant and then a professor of animal anatomy at the Natural History Museum in uh, France. He was no in Paris, sorry, I should say. Um, he was notable for serving under three different opposing French governments, so uh, under the Revolution, then the Napoleonic governments and the monarchy, all of those without being beheaded, which was quite unusual for scientists in this time period. And as you can see from this picture on the left-hand side of his slide, he was very pleased with himself um, at his achievements. I don't know if that's actually true, but that is quite a, a sassy picture. Essentially, we can say that this gentleman was the founder of vertebrate paleontology, so looking at things with backbones. He grouped vertebrates using comparative anatomy, and that includes living organisms, but he um, incorporated into his scheme fossils. He established by studying fossils that extinction um, had occurred. He proved that vertebrate fossils that were found in the rocks of northern Europe were not the same species as um, living equivalents that were then found in the tropics, and they, thus they must be extinct organisms. Indeed, he went on to suggest that extinctions occurred as a result of periodic cat catastrophic floods. This is an idea that became known as cat catastrophism, um, and that was, for a while, kind of bandied about as the polar opposite to uniformitarianism that we met with James Hutton. Um, and nowadays we recognise that there are elements of truth to both of those ideas. He was the first person to uh, correctly identify a Bavarian fossil that's shown on the right-hand side here as a small flying reptile, which he named Pterodactylus, and he speculated correctly that there had been a time when reptiles rather than mammals had been the dominant fauna in the skies. He didn't mention, but I will do because I work on them, that you know, there was an even longer time period before both of those where insects were the only game in town when it came to flying organisms. But let's, let's move on beyond that. That's a personal bugbear. But we've got to recognise that you know people are three-dimensional, so is history, and he was by no means a perfect gentleman or a perfect scientist or a human, perfect human being, as none of us are. In, in his particular case, he made contributions to scientific racialism um, with work on the origins of different human races, which we would consider by today's standards to be very questionable. Um, and he, his work led to even more problematic stances down the line. He also didn't believe in any form of evolution. He didn't think the morphology could change over time. So scientifically, some of his ideas were incorrect as well. The other person I've mentioned as another player on this um, slide is Alexandre Brognat, um, who with Cuvier established the stratigraphy of the rocks around Paris based on fossils in a similar manner to that of William Smith in the UK, which we met on the last slide. I wanted to finish this video by introducing Mary Anning. Mary Anning was an English collector of fossils, largely in the Jurassic marine rocks around Lyme Regis and Dorset in the southwest of England. 
This is another um, unusual um, kind of person from UK society that I'll mention because she was from a poor family. Her father was a cabinet maker and he died when she was 11. She struggled financially for much of her life. She was collecting fossils at a time when it was fashionable in the late 18th and early 19th century. And she, this was a valuable means of income for four poor families such as hers to supplement their income from other areas. And this is the primary reason that Annie did it. The only portrait from her during her life with her trusty dog who was her companion in fossil collecting is shown on the left hand side here. And some of her notes are shown in the middle. And these reflect that her discoveries included marine reptiles. She found one of the first ichthyosaur skeletons and the first two plesiosaur skeletons. She found the first pterosaur skeleton to be discovered, so flying reptile, outside of Germany, and she discovered important fish fossils as well. And it's also of note that this is our first woman, the first woman that I've mentioned in any of these videos, and it's worth reflecting on why that is, because that is because in the 19th century, the scientific community in Europe was largely made of religious gentlemen. These were um, people um, that had lots of spare time on their hands because being, say, a priest or a vicar was not necessarily a full-time occupation. And generally, to be a scientist, outside of these very specific circumstances that I've just mentioned for Mary Anning, you also had to be independently wealthy because there was no way of making a woman by doing this. And as a result of this framework, there was an in-group versus out-group thing going on, and women rarely received full credit or even any credit for their scientific contributions. They were barred. They weren't even allowed to join the learned societies of this time period. And so that was one of the reasons why many of the discoveries of Mary Anning were first um, illustrated, as shown on the right-hand side here, and um, were described by other male scientists at the time who bought her discoveries off her. Her position in society was also made a bit more um, kind of, she was less prominent and easier to take advantage of because she was a religious dissenter. She was not a member of the Church of England and this further marginalized her in UK societies. So at this time period, even if as a woman she had been allowed to attend university, which she wasn't, but even if she was, dissenters were not allowed into universities at this time period. During this time period, you had to be a member of the Church of England. And this is why Anning was consulted on issues of anatomy and of fossil collecting by many members of the gentry. She collected fossils for many eminent male scientists, but was never credited in her lifetime for her abilities. And indeed, many scientists refused to believe that a young woman from such a deprived background could possess the knowledge and the skills that she seemed to display. A fine example of this is the quote I've put on this slide here, which reads that it is certainly a wonderful instance of divine favour that this poor, ignorant girl should be so blessed, um, said a lady in society at the same time. And I think that um, this quote I've put from Mary Anning, the world has used me so unkindly, I fear it has made me suspicious of everyone, is actually really quite well-founded. Society was really poor to Mary Anning. So that brings us to the end of this video. And in the next video, we're going to be looking at some of the developments that happened in the Victorian era. So let's move on and I'll see you there in video number four.